Now our final uh, speaker um, is Joseph Quinn, who uh, teaches history in University College Dublin. And uh, he is, we've been talking at the macro level so far to today. He's going to bring us down to the micro level. He's going to look at a particular constituency, the constituency of North Longford. And uh, the interesting angle in Joseph's presentation is that his great great grandfather was J.P. Farrell, who is the or was the MP for North Longford up to 1918. So, without further ado, if the slides are in <coughs> business. That's it. You're there. Okay, Very good. Okay, Joseph Quinn. Just to say, um, it's a pleasure to speak uh, at this fantastic event. Um, it is a fantastic event, um, possibly among the youngest people, not just like, not just in the speaker list, but also present at this thing. Just looking around the room, I think I'm in the younger category, definitely. And I just want to say it's a great shame that many of my contemporaries of my age group and younger are not at this event because it's truly inspiring. There's a great selection of papers and very thought-provoking, and it's broadly arranged on either side of the spectrum um, that we are considering um, in this election uh, between IPP and Sinn Féin. Um, and I want to say how important it is that we have discussions like this in this era of commemorations, particularly at this juncture. Um, it cannot be overstated. The talk that I'm giving today is about my great-great-grandfather, uh, J.P. Farrell, um, upon whom I'm writing um, a biography. I'm struggling through uh, the process of writing a biography. I've never done it before, so uh, um, those of you who would like to read that, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer. Um, but I will give you a sample of um, my research thus far. And just to say that J.P. has been the subject of, he's featured in the work of people such as Paul Bew, Marie Coleman, and several others. So he's been quite lucky compared with a lot of other Home Rule MPs who faded into oblivion. He's actually one of the fortunate ones. Um, but I will uh, commence my talk in any case. The history of Longford features, in a perhaps disproportionate regard, the story of the exploits of many individuals who carry the surname Farrell or O'Farrell. The most familiar of these in relation to the modern history of Longford and of Ireland is J.P. Farrell, a man who served his county as a distinguished historian, an accomplished journalist, and a tenacious activist, and in terms of his legacy and accomplishments, possibly the most well-known politician that the county has ever produced. He was the author of A History of the County Longford, founder of the Longford Leader newspaper, and he represented both the West Cabin and North Longford constituencies as an Irish Parliamentary Party member in Westminster in a political career spanning some 23 years. The Home Rule movement, represented in the House of Commons by the IPP, for whom Farrell had stood as an elected member from 1895 until the 1918 general election, were indisputably dominant in the public life throughout most of Ireland from the 1870s until the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914. By the close of that same conflict, disgruntled nationalists abandoned the Home Rulers in favour of Sinn Féin separatism. Farrell was a notable casualty in this political shift. Since then, many regard Farrell as symbolic of a constitutional nationalist tradition that lost its place in Irish politics in December 1918, almost a century ago. Some have considered him, along with his family and followers, to be representative of a more loyalist or pro-British perspective, where the promotion of recruitment for the British Armed Forces, the erection of commemorative memorials for the same war dead, and along with the rejection of physical force nationalism in favour of moderate constitutional politics were nothing more than the faded symptoms of an anglicised culture within Longford society. Others simply thought Farrell to be a tyrannical presence in Midland politics, an excessively powerful man who wielded his influence unfairly, inflicting great hardship and suffering upon his opponents by methods of agrarian agitation and using his newspaper to harass his enemies through the publication of scathing and humiliating remonstrances, which called for rallies, boycotts, against anyone who deviated from his line of policy. 
Indeed, his defeat, or overthrow, in the general election of 1918 may be construed as a long-awaited blow by a suppressed Fenian element within the nationalist community in Longford, who had long desired to depose a leading figure of the so-called Ancien Regime as a prelude to the coming re revolution. This paper provides a brief outline of the life, political career, and decline of a Longfordian nationalist who had come to embody the spirit of the Home Rule movement, not just in his home county, but throughout the entire Midlands region. James Patrick Farrell was born on the 15th of May, 1865, in Strokestown, County Roscommon. His father, Patrick Farrell, born 1834, was a native of Moidu. I'm very sorry this doesn't seem to be coming across very well, but you may not be able to see that. Um, he was a native of Moidu, County Longford, and he operated a gravel quarry in the area during his early years before he, marrying Anne Lynham of Strokestown, where James had been born, and he became manager of the Lynham family mill in Castle Ree. JP was the eldest of six children that Patrick and Anne would bear during their 14-year-long uh, marriage. Tragically, JP and his siblings were deprived of their mother when she died following the birth of his brother Aloysius in 1878. At 13 years of age, J.P. Farrell became the head of the household after his father left Longford and his children after the death of his wife to work for the Dublin-based company Pym Brothers Limited. Patrick would never uh, return to live in Longford again, and he died on Christmas Eve 1907 in Gardner Street in Dublin at the age of 74. In their father's absence, J.P. and the other children were cared for by their aunt, Miss Annie Atkinson, who acted in local parentis for six years until her death, which came just four months after JP had reached his 19th birthday. Although there is precious little information next slide, um, available about the early life of JP Farrell, we know that he was one of the most famous day pupils to attend St. Mel's College, uh, which was established in September 1865, the same year that he was born. Farrell was very much a product of the reading room culture in terms of the many political and cultural nationalist initiatives that um, he would go on to spearhead in the local area. The reading room was very, a very common phenomenon in Ireland at that particular time, and it emerged in Europe in the 18th century as a means through which ordinary people, irrespective of their class or their socioeconomic status, could gather to read and discuss current affairs, and if their education was limited or non-existent, they could self-educate themselves in matters of politics and culture. And this is particularly important in Ireland. In Ireland, reading rooms were established in the 1840s by Daniel O'Connell's Repeal Association at the urging of Thomas Davis and the Young Ireland Movement. J.P. Farrell's diary for 1884 is possibly the best source just to say that this is an example of local activities that he was involved in. He was a member of the local band. Um, he was a euphemonium player. And this is his, he was also a gifted actor and dramatist. And this is him, perhaps, this wouldn't be acceptable nowadays, but um, just to say that's taken from a Longford Leader, so it's based on a sketch of what apparently Farrell looked like. I think it's a very good likeness, if you ask me. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, next slide. Uh, J.P. Farrell's Diary for 1884 is possibly the best source available on the early life of this aspiring politician, and from it, we can track his rise in local politics and current affairs, as well as his own personal struggles. Farrell was, among other things, a chronic anxiety sufferer through his early life. That's very clear. And um, whether he ever recovered from it is something that we can't determine. Um, but what is clear is that actually this same year, that this diary um, here is set, 1884, was a year that was very momentous for J.P. Farrell personally. It was during this year that he became Longford correspondent for Jasper Tully's Roscommon Herald. And he also conceived of the idea of founding his own newspaper. Next slide. Um, a new idea has occurred to me, and today I proceed to put into motion the starting of a national journal in Longford. Such a thing has long been wanting, and this whole day I was occupied in writing a circular to 12 of the leading men of the town. Whether it be a success or not is still, it, it, it's still to be tried, but I'm told it will. And that from that idea that he conceived of came the Longford leader, which is still in existence today. Um, like many members of his generation, Farrell was a cattle farmer who would tend to his animals on a daily basis. During their early years, the Farrell family had the same um, ordinary everyday hardships that everybody in the agrarian class was enduring. His decision to concentrate on agrarian grievances as his main field of activism was in many ways a natural run due to his membership of that particular group. Uh, he was a particularly staunch supporter of land reform, most definitely due to his own farming background 
and he held a very deep passion for agricultural pursuits in his own day-to-day -day life, and this is reflected by numerous diary entries in his 1884 journal. He sympathised with the plight of the small farming class, and he reflected on their downtrodden status within society. It is a great wonder to me how it, occur, it occurs that the farmers can content themselves so well to a life of toil, dirt and misery and see others uh, who may be no better fitted uh, by God living in purple and fine linen on the produce of their toil. And yet without these very men, what will we do? But see how little is thought of them, how despised they are in fact. Farrell was a highly noteworthy example of a United Irish League campaigner following in the tradition of radical agrarians such as John Dillon, the leader of the anti parnellite faction of the Irish party, and William O'Brien, the founder of the UIL. By combining regional journalism and a popular means of agrarian agitation with local grassroots party <laughs> political activity, Farrell utilised a tried and tested blueprint of localised political activism and agitation to great effect and succeeded in transforming the social and economic landscape of the County Longford during his tenure as the Nationalist representative. His methods were borrowed from James Daly, an agrarian activist and politician from County Mayo, who had risen to become one of the most prominent defenders of tenants' rights during the 1870s. Next slide. Farrell campaigned for agrarian agitation in areas where he felt tenant grievances had not been adequately addressed, and he wrote prolifically on the subject in the Longford Leader editorial during the 1890s and 1900s. He was imprisoned four times between 1890 and 1910, contracting an illness during his last period of confinement in Kilmainham Jail, which is widely believed to contribute to a general decline in his health, leading to his early death in December 1921. In the early 1890s, Farrell was serving as the local branch secretary and co-delegate of the Longford Irish National Federation, or otherwise known as INF. During the 1890s and 1900s, uh, Farrell wrote regularly on behalf of the beleaguered Longford tenants to the INF headquarters in Dublin to seek aid from the Evicted Tenants Fund. By this time, Farrell had risen substantially far enough to consider running for a constituency seat. In 1895, Farrell contested his first election for Kilkenny and was defeated, but was not down for long and was elected to a vacated seat in West Cavan. Farrell's position as Longford's leading political representative was solidified in many ways from 1900 onwards. He was elected unopposed as Justin McCarthy's replacement on the North Longford constituency in the, in the general election of 1900. And in the 1906 election, he had been re-elected unopposed, followed by the same results in both of the elections held in 1910. And um, this, is a, this photograph, the previous photo, it's okay, it's okay. The previous photograph, um, that was taken in 1899, and that was a famous photograph that a lot of MPs would have had taken of themselves at the famous entrance to the Palace of Westminster. Next slide. Um, just to explain this for you, Longford was actually, I didn't have time to go into the paper, but Longford is one of these kind of, um, it's a kind of a, a, a place that's very much up for grabs. It's one of these constituencies that can be very easily contested. Um, and it's shared by several, it's like several roving Irish Parliamentary Party MPs are s basically sent around to stand for various different constituencies in certain areas, and North and South Longford were one of them. Justin McCarthy, <coughs> um, was, who you probably have heard, a very famous liberal journalist um, and IPP uh, member who stood for North Longford for a number of years, and Edward Blake, who actually nearly became Prime Minister of Canada, uh, but he had a nervous disposition and he was prone to resigning whenever he was put under pressure. So he was actually the premier, first Premier of Ontario and nearly became Prime Minister and then some enemy basically attacked him and, under, and cracked under the pressure and he resigned and blew his chances of becoming Canada's first Prime Minister. And then he came into the Imperial Parliament, he came over to London and he, he, an easy entry into British politics was through the Irish Home Rule Party. And Dylan was the person who was managing him. And what happened was um, Tim Healy uh, recognized Blake's weakness and he started to bully him just for fun. T Healy was a very combative individual, but he started to bully Blake for fun. And Blake would start resigning all the time. And then John Dillon would follow him out when he'd storm out of a meeting. And he would just tell him, no, uh, Blake, listen, this isn't Canada. You're not going to do that here. He said, you have a seat, you have a responsibility, and God help you if you you're not pulling any stunts. And he managed to keep Blake on side for 15 years. That must have been a very torturous existence. But for most of that time, Blake was 
uh, he was representative for South Longford. Um, so until the advent of people like J.P. Farrell, you had very famous home rulers holding both those constituencies. J.P. was the first time in a long time that a Longfordman had actually held a constituency in Longford when he was elected. So um, Farrell also served as chairman of the Rural District Council from 1899 to 1902, and he lent his weight as sitting MP for North Longford for the levying of Parliament and the construction of eight, uh, five labourers' cottages in 1901. In addition, one of Farrell's greatest collaborative achievements was the Wyndham Land Act passed in August 1903. It was the recompense that many UIL members had sought for the Irish tenant farmers, and for which Farrell had shared a stint in Kilmainham Jail with ten other Home Rule MPs. He continued his agrarian activism, especially during the Ranch Wars, next slide, um, of 1907, for which he would be again incarcerated in 1908 and 1909. The final incarceration, as I told you, weakened him fatally, and he was forced to spend a period convalescing in the Harrogate Spa near London after having contracted tuberculosis in Kilmainham Jail. He never shook it off. He never really recovered from it, and he was continually paralysed by bouts of influenza um, whenever or flus or even common colds whenever he'd get them. Um, this is a photograph of him with his family uh, before he was incarcerated in 1907. I'm not going to go through all the members of the family, but I can tell his wife is sitting in the middle. It's a very faded photograph, but um, he was in fairly good, rude health before this incarceration and thereafter became considerably weakened. And we don't really have many photographs after that. Okay. Where's your grandfather? Uh, he's at the back. Uh, sorry, my grandfather, um, I couldn't tell you just okay. offhand. Um, now we must move forward to the events of the December 1918 election and that last period of uh, battle that our pr protagonist would offer before his demise. Next slide. Um, just next slide, sorry. Um, it begins with a famous South Longford by-election of 1917, contested by an imprisoned Joseph McGuinness, which is among the first parliamentary seats won by the Sinn Féin party. As Mel Farrell notes, the stakes were very high when a vacancy arose in South Longford after the death of John Phillips, and the IPP leadership very much played an active role in the campaign. McGuinness's victory was very a very true reflection on the growing weaknesses in the local IPP party political operation, even under the control of a parliamentar parliamentarian as strong and renowned as Farrell. However, the IPP generally had suffered because of their support for the government during the First World War, and the changes in the public mood have been evident since the volunteer split of October 1914. As early as 1914, Farrell wrote to his political superior, John Dillon, communica communicating his concern at the situation in Longford. In reply to your inquiry, I'm sorry to tell you that we're getting a good deal of trouble here as to Redmond's action regarding recruiting. Phillips has gone pro-German mad and is fiercely denouncing Redmond in all directions. McGuinness, our secretary for years and a staunch supporter of the party in all weathers up to this, has gone dead against us and is using all his influence here against the party and its leader. In fact, he is quite Sinn Féin. The vast bulk of the volunteers are sound, and we are going to set up a county board to affiliate all the new body on Sunday next. I'm calling a meeting to enrol under Redmond and set aside McGuinness in a Sinn Féin crowd. I believe it will be a great success too. In September 1914, John Redmond had backed Asquith's government in their decision to go to war, and the IPP offered their support to the British war effort in exchange for a promise to place Home Rule in the statute book. He evidently held the view that the new Irish volunteers would be performing the same duties as their predecessors, and he called upon them at his famous speech in Woodenbridge to serve not just in Ireland, but wherever the firing line extends. Joe Lee observes the huge gambit that Redmond had made in his attempt to unite all of Ireland behind the British war effort. County Longford is a very evident example of the danger that Redmond placed his movement in at that very moment, because the Woodenbridge call, as we all know, uh, resulted in a divide, not, not only nationally, but of, of the Longford core of the Irish volunteers. After the war, Redmond's IPP was a spent force, having served as little more than a recruiting service for Britain, while offering nothing to the Irish public but a tired promise of home rule, and also a fatally they were fatally tainted by the high rate of casualties at the front. Broadly speaking, the record of recruitment for the British Army in Longford may well be considered to be very poor, with about 1,100 men enlisting in the Earl of Granard's battalion in 1914, but only 377 men joining up in 1915. On balance, Farrell's resolute support for local wartime recruitment activity appears to have been a profitless exercise. 
In the aftermath of the executions that followed the 1916 Rising in Dublin, uh, the term Sinn Féin in the Republic became very popular in Longford, as elsewhere. Mel Farrell notes that the extent to which Sinn Féin had become a rallying cry after 1916 is best illustrated in the North Roscommon by-election, the first electoral victory by the separatists. Plunkett's victory had a very disturbing effect, and when South Longford's John Phillips died after an illness in April 1917, the IPP had to mobilise to consolidate their hold over the two Longford constituencies. When the brother of Frank McGuinness, Joseph, who was imprisoned in Lewes prison for his role in the Rising, opted to contest the by-election, local home rulers were disturbed, since at this point electoral contests were still a rarity in nationalist politics. At the December 1910 general election, two-thirds of the Irish party MPs had been elected unopposed, remember. By this time, however, there had been a very considerable decline in IPP and UIL influence. In April, in April 1917, the Longford leader criticised the county's nationalists for allowing the organisation structures to deteriorate, which the editorial maintained might have been avoided if the League had heeded Farrell's repeated warnings to keep the League branches alive. The local organisation in Longford could not agree on a Home Rule candidate, and with three candidates, Joseph Flood, Patrick McKenna and Hugh Garahan, been nominated. This caused considerable confusion and a crisis within IPP ranks, which was reported on in the Longford leader. In addition, the local bishop, Bishop Hoare, created further difficulties in an endorsement of Flood rather than McKenna, allegedly because of McKenna's involvement in the party's long-running feud. In the final analysis, it appears that infighting within IPP ranks and defections that also occurred during his time had swayed local voters and led to the McGuinness victory. Farrell felt frustrated at this time, desperate in fact, at the deteriorating situation within Nationalist Ireland, pleading with his superior Dillon for the party to take action and with harsh words for Redmond's lack of leadership. Next slide. Why on earth is there not a meeting of the Irish party called in Dublin to do something or to take counsel to defend ourselves before the general election comes on us. My experience for the last few weeks in Longford convinces me that there are still good th thousands of good nationalists with us if we afford them a chance. But what can we do when they see one side overrun the county and no reply on ours? Some months ago I wrote to Mr. Redmond pointing this out to him and asking him to summon a meeting of the party. I received a formal reply stating that he'd consider my suggestions, but since then nothing has been done. I heard from a priest here that he is to resign after the convention. I think that if he does not intend to lead us in a fight against Sinn Féin, his plain duty to us who have supported him so loyally is to resign and let some man lead who will fight as well as lead. The nature of John Redmond's fall is well known, and it is no secret that he was unpopular, even within his own party during his final days. However, his sudden death in March 1918 left Nationalist Ireland in shock and truly marked an end to a long era of parliamentary constitutional nationalism. Within just a month of Redmond's death, Prime Minister Lloyd George introduced a conscription, uh, resulting in outrage from the IPP benches in the House of Commons. Farrell was among many Home Rule MPs who gave the government a piece of his mind on that day, with the day the bill was announced. And he did so with a tribute to his recently departed leader. I think the way in which our late lamented leader, Mr. Redmond, was treated during his life and has now been treated after his death is a shocking commentary on any dealings whatsoever, and by, whatsoever by Irishmen with the British government. A long anti-conscription campaign would ensue, which briefly saw IPP and Sinn Féin representatives join forces in their mutual effort to defeat British plans, but not notably Farrell was not part of that particular collaborative effort. However, it was very clear to many IPP members that the prognosis for their survival in the general election was fairly grim. As Mel Farrell observes, a number of Home Rule MPs came to the conclusion that they were fighting a losing battle, and of the 68 party MPs who held their seats at the dissolution of Parliament, 32 chose to withdraw from public life. J.P. Farrell, always the fighter, was not among them. Again, there was a slow start to IPP campaigning, and only in November 1918, that the Home Rule Convention in Longford conferred Farm as an, Farrell as a nominee for the newly created Longford constituency as IPP candidate. Even his old enemy McKenna came out in his support to ra and urged Longford Home Rulers to rally to the green flag and vote for J.P. Farrell. Sinn Féin members, despite animosity, still respected Farrell, with one member of Sinn Féin later stating that Farrell was as powerful in Ireland as Redmond, Dillon and Devlin put together. His record in land agitation made him a highly influential figure across the county, and he controlled and edited the Longford leader, giving him the advantage of positive press coverage 
and he enjoyed much support from the Catholic Church, particularly Bishop Hoare, who strongly condemned revolutionary societies. Local organisation of campaigning seemed to have been going well in Calo, and IPP campaigners joined force with the AOH and the UIL uh, to hold a collection for Farrell's election campaign. The meeting was said to have been a spirited one, with cheers and applause and laughter for Farrell, who promised to give the enemy some, as uh, using an Americanism at that time. The register, the equivalent of an exit poll, reflected a very large majority of attendees were in favour of Farrell. Days later, Farrell had a deb debilitating stroke and was unable to take par any further part in his own election campaign. Sinn Féin opponents showed respect by steering their march away from the market square, and the Longford Leader editorial acknowledged this considerate gesture towards the Farrell family. I'll just show you next, uh, next one. They kept all noise away as far as possible, and even offered to go further away to hold their meeting if desired. Such a spirit does them credit. And it sends shivers up my spine when I was typing up that slide uh, earlier on today. I typed down the date 14th of December 1918. That editorial was published yesterday, 100 years ago. Just amazing. Despite his incapacitation on polling day, the Longford leader's front page displayed Farrell's likeness under the banner, The Man for Longford. Mel Farrell notes the effect of Farrell's stroke uh, had on the overall vote in Longford. Um, he notes that it's very difficult to gauge, but that the scale of his defeat was very clear. Par uh, Farrell polled 4,173 to McGuinness's 11,122. Um, so that was basically a ratio of three to one, effectively. Um, his days in Irish politics were effectively at an end. Now, his demise and downfall, as with so many other grassroots and rank-and-file home rulers, just to conclude, occurred as he attempted to fight an inevitably doomed battle against uh, resistance against the forces of political revolution which had risen to the fore in Ireland in 1918, mainly as a consequence of the Great War and its effect on Irish society. Michael Wheatley, for instance, concludes that the IPP was virtually destroyed by the four years of the First World War. Once, dis once conscription was proposed by the British government in 1918, revolution seemed to be the only course that any committed nationalist could adopt. Marie Coleman once raised a very important question of whether or not Farrell could have or should have defected to Sinn Féin in the same manner that his longtime friend and colleague Lawrence Gannell had done. It's very possible that he might well have considered this course because he continued his friendship with Gannell after he defected, mm -hmm. particularly with re regard to the dismissive manner which Redmond had often treated him. But his loyalty to John Dillon was absolute. It could not be questioned. And he continued to write to him um, for many years after he was defeated, encouraging Dillon to keep the UIL going strong and alive and even to organize another convention, which he said to include all our old colleagues who fought at the last general election. Farrell's feelings was that it would be a shame to allow the movement to die. And he said this, it would be a real mistake to let our friends dissolve all over the county, when many of them I know are only too willing to go on if they get even a percent. And his son, Gerald, who he had intended as his political successor, clearly called on Dylan at his Dublin home to pass on his Farrell's regards. Farrell's last letter to Dylan, and I'm going to finish up on this note, Farrell's last letter to Dylan was a very sad one. It was a draft of a resolution passed by the UIL branch in Longford, demanding that Dylan take action to revive the League. As Farrell's resolution states, we think it useless for all our branch to keep struggling on in County Longford when all the other branches and counties seem to be doing nothing. Thereafter, Farrell set about writing a short memoir of his life and times, a sure sign that he was kind of preparing for the end. By 1921, as the Anglo-Irish War raged across the country, Farrell's wife, Bridget, became ill, and despite treatment at hospital, she continued to decline. He would write to his uh, daughter, Mary, who had served as a doctor in the Great War in the Royal Army Medical Corps, um, that he had been to visit her, her mother in hospital and been very distressed to see her looking so very th win, uh, sorry, thin and worn and weak. My great-great-grandmother, Bridget Fitzgerald Farrell, died in August 1921. Just four months later, Farrell, now a beaten and heartbroken man, could you just move the slide um, for, um, back, actually? Could you just move it back? There, just leave it there. Um, just four months later, Farrell, who is now a beaten and heartbroken man, he passed away in Longford on the 11th of December 1921. It could be argued that in the end, his death came to him as a mercy. Um, for many years, 
uh, the legacy of my great-great-grandfather cast a cloud of suspicion over our family in the Longford area uh, due to the politics he represented. And I'm, I'm not the only member of my family here tonight. There my, all my, also my cousin, Lucius Farrell, um, former owner and editor of the Longford Leader and grandson of J.P. Farrell is here present. And he would attest to this, that there was a taint that stuck as a result of our family's involvement with home rule politics. And I hope as we commemorate the great changes that took place in 1918, we take time to remember all those stalwart nationalists who served Ireland loyally according to their lights. Like my ancestor, they were, no, they were no less Irish and no less patriotic than the men and women who took their place. They sacrificed a great deal, their family life and their health, as Farrell did, for the cause of Ireland. Let them be remembered and never forgotten again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joseph. That, that, uh, well, that was fantastic, and I couldn't, I couldn't help but feel, as I listened to the paper, or to remember, as I listened to your paper, that great line of Speaker Tip O'Neill, all politics is local. And there's a lot of truth in, 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 in uh, that, so uh, well, thank you for that. Um, we have a, a little time for uh, questions before we uh, will close up, but could I abuse my position as chair and ask the first on the question of Dermot, if I may, because um, I, I'm very persuaded by your uh, conclusion that, 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 that partition and Ulster was uh, critical in the loss of support for the Irish Parliamentary Party. My own uh, researches would tend to confirm that. But what has always puzzled me is why it is such an important uh, defining issue in 1918, and yet when the Anglo-Irish Treaty comes along in December 1921 and is debated in December 21 and January 22, it isn't an issue, and it's not an issue in the Civil War. It's all about the, uh, the oath and, and the Republic. Um, the issue has evaporated within those two years. Is there an explanation for that, or what's your perception of it? I would go further and say that it had ceased to be an issue even by the 1918 general election itself. It evaporated sometime between uh, late 1917 and mid-1918, because I think its only relevance really was as a weapon uh, capable of being used by Sinn Féin against the Irish party. Sinn Féin were able to uh, use it to point to the failure of the Irish party to do what they had promised to do, which was to deliver home rule or self-government for an all-Ireland state. And uh, once, as soon as it was clear that Sinn Féin were in the driving seat themselves, which certainly from the time of Arthur Griffith's victory in East Cavan in June 1918 was clear, as soon as that was clear that Sinn Féin were now in the driving seat, the issue evaporated because they had no interest in drawing attention to it. They were now going to be uh, held accountable for whether they could deliver a 32 county state and so you find that most of the campaigning in late 1918 is on sovereignty issues as it was three years later in the treaty treaty debates okay that, that makes one wonder even more about the cynicism of politicians <laughs> you had a question yeah turn it again and um, uh, frank mentioned this morning about magical thinking economically we've obviously magical thinking there as well was there any hint from all the papers you read a suggestion that there might be difficulty in forcing the Northern Unionists, particularly after the 36 Division, the Battle of the Somme and all that, of forcing them into United Ireland? That somehow or other, Lord George would click his fingers. There's no evidence. Uh, well, there isn't a hint to that from anybody. There's one, news, one newspaper stands out in the group, in the papers that I studied. The Tume Herald had a very thoughtful editor, a uh, very literate. He wrote very well-considered editorials, and he, uh, for example, he was the only one who tried to understand the motives of the British in introducing um, uh, conscription in 1918, but he also uh, 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 tried to consider the implications of trying to coerce Ulster um, into home rule. The, the others, uh, most of the others, were simply, it was just a, a, a catch cry, and there was very little it's very little evidence uh, that I can see in the editorials that they, that they, I mean, for example, the Clare Champion in saying Lloyd George has torn up the Home Rule Act by refusing to coerce Ulster. 
there's no further development of that point to see that, you know, what's entailed in that. Yes. Yes. No, oh, there's a, a certain parallel there that has been continuing and seems to, as I say, flourish, as it were. The same, it's the same thing that's happening today. The press are afforded the freedom of the press. Now, from the, speed, from the talks the other world given, it was crystal clear that a, like it, when the press has freedom, shouldn't that be their, their editorials should be objective? not subjective, because doesn't that, as I say, steer the course of the events or the course of history in another, in whatever light that they want to? And why isn't that being challenged now, and why isn't there objectivity demanded of the media in view of the, in light of the fact that they have freedom? Surely the real object, the real objectivity of the press generally is the variety of organs that there that there are organs for different opinions? We're very, very, very close to fake news and such arguments. I'm afraid. Does anybody else want to come into that? Well, I would say that uh, you know where we want objectivity in the media is in the reporting of news, but where editorial comment is concerned, I don't think we should object to expression of opinion. Yeah. I mean, that's what the freedom of the press means, really. That uh, you know, uh, opinion. Uh, the editorials uh, uh, is where you go to, to to look for opinions, the opinion of the newspaper. Uh, it's where the, the a problem is where the dividing line between news and commentary is obliterated. Um, and did you just, yes. I have actually just one very brief one, that, not that I'm very knowledgeable about the media, but I think a, a very good novel solution to sort out the you know, the problems po uh, posed in this era of fake news and unreliable media coverage or press coverage is to, uh, you know, sort of kill two birds with one stone and start employing all the unemployed uh, uh, history graduates to come out of university. <laughs> because at least we know how to write a good story and factually. That's, uh, the, um, you know, uh, the problem you know, I'm, is, only, I'm only joking. But the problem anyway. is, so Joseph, if they're not teaching history anymore, there won't be yeah. very many more history yeah. graduates yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to, to come back to a, a, a point that Bertie made at the, you know, at the, very, you know, at the very start. It, that does beg a question. Uh, quite a lot of the Irish Parliamentary Party MPs had backgrounds in as local newspaper proprietors and like, historians, uh, and historians. like JP Farrell. Yeah. And, 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 and that I found in intriguing in relation to Dermot's paper that they were, they were moving notwithstanding that traditional link with the Irish Parliamentary Party that, the, 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 that from the 1890s onwards it seems to me that the party makes a huge effort to co-opt and local newspaper owners, even even difficult people like Jasper Tully, who was uh, mentioned, uh, uh, you know, that particular relationship doesn't work out. But most of them do, and yet, and, and despite that courting of the press, there is that a movement that you've identified, uh, Dermot, which I think is very significant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Funny thing. Um, I think Albert Reynolds bought the Longford Leader. Did he? At one stage. No, 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 he was the Longford leader. Anyway, the real question is, the real question is, had there not been a war, there would have been a general election in probably 1915. And how would things, this is repeat of the earlier question, how would things have fared electorally then? The partition issue was there in the wings from 1913. Yeah, It had to be confronted at some point. Yeah. So if it wasn't confronted, uh, I mean, if it, uh, you know, uh, if the war hadn't intervened, it was all set to be, con the very last week of July 1914, mm -hmm. it was due to be confronted. Yeah. Uh, the, it, it looked like um, um, there was a debate on the amending bill, which Asquith was introducing, to provide for exclusion of Ulster. And, and that was going to be, the, uh, the only thing that stopped that debate taking place was the onset of the First World War. So at some point... Yeah, no, sorry, sorry. people. You know, at, at some point, early or late, the problem um, had to be confronted, it had to be faced. There was no evading the issue. The, the, the issue was being played out already on the streets of Ulster 
with the Ulster Volunteers. So had Redmond and company signed up to a 26 counties, there would have been a civil war of some kind anyway? Possibly. Not necessarily. I think that the one difference that might, uh, we're only speculating, <coughs> the, what you do notice, the, in 1914, Redmond had agreed to go along with county plebiscites as a way of uh, bringing about a, a temporary exclusion. So it was county plebiscites, uh, which would have led to four counties being excluded for a period of six years. Mm. Now, when that debate was about to be held at the end of July, he was planning to move his position slightly by abandoning the six-year time limit, but he would hold out for county plebiscites. Now, we um, we don't know um, how opinion would have, but opinion hadn't been radicalised. So we would have had a 28 county. Uh, a 28 county, but we don't, I mean, the what happened, the difference between then and the post-rebellion 1916 scenario was that the there was a much more febrile atmosphere in the country. Uh, uh, opinion had become radicalised. It was more difficult to get the kind of compromise that was necessary on partition. But we, we could speculate. We, it's quite possible that opinion would have reacted, for, for, uh, uh, you know, uh, against Redmond in 1914, just as much as in 1916. And it should should be noted also that um, a lot of historians of the First World War, people like Neil Ferguson, constantly bring up the point that when you know when war broke out um, in Europe, um, British intervention was not guaranteed. In fact, actually, it was only a fluky thing. Many, many people who walked into the cabinet room um, the, the morning that the decision to go to war was made were thinking about this issue. They were concentrating on the issue in Ulster. But British attention was not on what was going on in Sarajevo um, or, in any, or on the uh, frontier between the German Empire and the Russian Empire but rather on uh, where the border, uh, this invisible line that has been drawn between parishes in Tyrone and Fermanagh. So, no so war, uh, that was actually no what they were... No war Britain, government, yeah. British government would have concentrated. Exactly, exactly. So it was, their, their attention was caught between the, yeah. si the growing crisis in Europe yeah, yeah. and the crisis yeah. in Ireland at that time. And you must remember that a civil war, if it had broken out, it wasn't just a civil war in Ireland, it was a civil war in the United Kingdom. Okay, it was a massive crisis. It cannot be understated. Oh, about How, giving Ireland back. Yeah, yeah. No, about the partition issue and about. Oh yeah, yeah. Even the, the whole Britain was uh, split yeah. over it. Yeah. The dreary steeples of Fermanagh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Prime, you wanted to come in. There is a curiosity. Uh, mentioned, and in my paper this morning, I mentioned how you're very subtle you discussed the Ulster Volunteers. Yeah. 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 I hardly ever find the P-word mentioned. They don't actually mention partition, actually. I thought when I turned to them saying, we want partition, we want a government for Northern Ireland. They don't say any of that. But what they say is, we insist on our rights as British citizens, and we fought the war, and we insist on that. We will not have home rule. It's just curious. They, 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 it's, it's in a word. I mean, it's on the horizon, but it's not particularly mentioned. And it may be for several reasons. Perhaps it's slightly embarrassing. What has to happen to those three other counties? Uh, you know, do we want to debate over that? Well, we don't mention it then. And then possibly the other thing was, well, we don't know what the future holds. Um, partition. You know, they're not going to be governed. They, they insist on their right to consent to how they're governed. But this hasn't been spelled out yet. It could mean, for example, no over the prior law. So maybe they're paying their bets carefully. It's just, it's just, it's very curious. But everyone should have known about partition. But I'm telling you, the politicians are not getting up and saying we want partition. No, 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 no. no. But isn't the situation, Brian, that 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 the Ulster was used as a tactic yeah. to yeah. sub to to kill Home Rule for the whole island, yes. and the tactic became the compromise, which is the yes. phrase that Alvin Jackson so uses in his in his uh, well, well, this study of Redmond and The Carson. idea of partition has been raised as a possibility. Mm. I'm saying it's curious that in 1918 that they don't put that as number one in their programme. Well, I, I actually I wrote an article for the Irish Times only, um, which was published only a number of um, no, number of months ago. Um, it was uh, sorry, about this, published six months ago, but it was um, it was on the day. It was, it was the article was focused on just the one day that I think just changed everything. It was the day that Lloyd George announced conscription and shattered the Home Rule Movement to finish them off. And it was very interesting because in the article I noted something which I, from my discernment of the 
the parliamentary record for that day. The last speaker uh, before the House divided, the last speaker that day was Edward Carson. And he warned the government about what they were about to do. He said, I, I warn the government, his words were, I warn the government that they may be raising two agitation, agitations, one on conscription and one against home rule. He actually argued, he actually argued, he, 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 he supported the motion, but he argued that the way in which Lloyd George had tied conscription to home rule, he, he hooked it on, he chained it to it, um, so that they would inevitably sink together. Um, he argued that this was not a good thing, and he, he knew, it was almost, his speech implies his own foreboding about what was about to occur. In other words, that partition and revolution were now inevitable. And it, from his words, it seems that nobody lamented this fact more than Carson. It's very clear from his words. So if, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Professor Walker, but that, that was just my reading of what he said. Yeah, but yeah, I know, I know, I know. So you didn't want to. Yeah. Sorry, Tom. Yeah. 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 Sorry, the, the, the leadership, leadership, the circulation. Circulation. I don't have figures. No, there are no, there are no reliable circulation figures for exactly. any papers uh, you, uh, for that era. The, 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 the modern practice of audited uh, figures uh, is modern. Mm -hmm. And the only paper, uh, to my knowledge, in that era that, that claimed to have uh, audited figures was, in fact, the Irish Daily Independent. Uh, but 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 it's it is just, uh, just extremely difficult to get figures. Just to answer and, and kind of answer the question, Lucius has suggested a figure of eight thousand for the Lockford leader. Yeah, right. yeah. Possibly. You can get you can get an idea from from two things. The geographical spread is usually given in the headline, the the banner on the front page that gives the names of the counties where the paper circulates, and the other thing is the the number of pages devoted to ads. I mean, there <laughs> there were pages set aside solely for advertisements and in some of the papers you can see you know there uh, it must be quite a uh, drawing in quite a lot of revenue from ads for example the, the Nina Guardian uh, seems to be you know a paper that circulates very widely around in surrounding counties and, adver and gets a lot of ad revenue yeah, the only source is an internal source if the yeah. business yeah. records of the paper are, are available from the period but but these were not on a public <coughs> It wasn't public information at the time. Thank you. A question for Joseph. Uh, just in relation to what you termed the, the taint, as you put it, which attached some people in your family felt after the changes in 1918, uh, and you have your relative with you, uh, the generation that's not here, but the one that came just after your great-great-grandfather, are you aware of any sort of sense of solidarity across the country with other similar families who may have felt something similar and may have given it the same label, a taint, a, a sort of, was there any sense that your relative who's here today or you through your research got that your family of Farrells had a quiet, sorrowful solidarity at least with fellow people in the same situation feeling a bit tainted across the country? Well, because at least there were others like you, you weren't in this alone. I, yeah, yeah. I think I could answer that. Yeah. First of all, um, uh, a lot of my aunts and uncles went into professions like law and uh, medicine and so on. So initially, uh, my aunt, who was one of the first lady doctors that qualified here in uh, the School of Medicine at UCT, because she worked uh, with uh, the, uh, in Britain uh, for many years, she could not get a position as, as a dispensary doctor. In fact, she was the most highly qualified uh, lady doctor uh, in vogue at the time. And it took her up to 1930 before she could get a placement. Regarding uh, my uncles and that, they, again, uh, we had to keep our head down, literally, when the Irish Free State came in and ultimately the Republic after that. 
with local councils in that where they were obliged to put advertising into the, the provincial papers for uh, legalized advertising for planning and things like that. They often did uh, boycott us or whatever. Now, for a guy like me growing up in the 1950s and that sort of thing, still in the 1950s, uh, in National School before I went away to boarding college, uh, very much I was treated as being sort of West Brit or call it what you like or, you know, sort of Anglo-Irish or whatever. And I found that that is, it was the interpretation down in rural Ireland at that stage. And it was because basically of the, the, my forebears there. Our, our family were most definitely treated differently. I, I could talk to any, uh, some, some members of, of our family would play it down, but there was definitely a sense. They are, people either treated them, like, I mean, I was speaking to my parents' generation, and my mum my is one of eight children. Um, like, I mean, aunts of mine have communicated both sides. They've said there was both respect and disrespect shown for the family, for who they were, for what they had stood for. Um, so there was definitely something <coughs> that had, that had occurred. Now I think I don't I don't I can't speak to solidarity with other groups or whatever like that. I think I believe that the home rulers, the old home rule generation, who had had to step to one side, people like Captain Stephen Gwynn and several others who you know it, 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 William it, Willie Redmond, William Archer Redmond, sorry, um, <coughs> it, Willie, it, John Redmond's son and uh, several others of that group that had been, they all kind of more or less faded into oblivion. They did keep in contact, they turned out at the openings of war memorials like the one that occurred in Wexford in 1931 and different events like that and they got together and they, there were certain publications circulated and they did and there was a sort of a kind of a, a, a camaraderie there and it was also connected. The, the home rulers tended to move in the same circles as British Legion people and First World War veterans they tended to kind of hang around in those same circles, ex-servicemen, ex-officers, Catholics in particular. Um, and they were, they were considered, they were associated with unionism, but they weren't uh, absolutely not unionist at all. They were very much nationalist, but their kind of nationalism, their brand of nationalism was prehistoric. It wasn't relevant anymore, and it was widely condemned. And it became increasingly unpopular as time went on. I, I would add that the only you know? solidarity I ever received, I was sent away to school when I was about 10. Fortunately, I was sent to a school in Kildare, Flanders Road College, and uh, the first guy to slap me on the back was John Bruton. Well, that brings the, the into into focus the question of the Central Party, <coughs> which which was originally yeah. John Dillon's party with yeah. with uh, no, no, uh, James Dillon's party mm. with Frank McDermott, and I remember John Bruton telling me that he came into on a politics because one of his uncles in Meath had been involved with the Central Party, and that that was his original link into. Finnegan Party. Yeah. So, um, there is some interesting work being done by uh, a guy called Martin O'Donoghue who has just um, finished a yeah, PhD yeah. in in in, in uh, Galway, and who is now actually the um, the academic uh, director of the Parnell Summer School, and he has been looking at the remnant, if you like, of yeah. the Irish Parliamentary Party in Irish public life post. Uh, 1922 uh, and he has a book coming out I think yes. with uh, Liverpool uh, within the next e year or so so that's another book for you to uh, put uh, to, to, to put on your list for uh, your <laughs> for your next uh, book token um, we're coming up to half four which is the time that we said we'd stop I could take one more question if there was somebody had mm -hmm. it all right you get in quickly <laughs> good I for you Dermot, if he if you could elaborate a little bit on the agreement between Redmond and Carson to implement home rule with the exclusion of the six counties in the north on a provisional <coughs> basis. Could you just, uh, and particularly, how come Carson on his side would have agreed to that? Well, there was no interaction between the two in that. It wasn't a negotiation, unlike Unlike what had happened in 1914 at the Buckingham Palace Conference, where Redmond and, Car and Carson and Bonner Law and Lloyd George and so on had sat around the same table, this time in, 19, in the summer of 1916, Redmond and, and Carson didn't speak to each other. They, 
Lloyd George shuttled between them separately he, and uh, they each went to their respective constituencies and tried to sell the proposal. That was a, uh, you know, um, that contained, of course, uh, the possibility of uh, disaster, uh, you know, but uh, that was, there was no, uh, you know, it wasn't an interaction. Uh, it was uh, Redmond, sorry, if we take Carson first, uh, Carson went to the Ulster Unionist Council with a lot of difficulty, he convinced them to accept the exclusion of a six-county block. And there were very vehement protests from representatives from Calvin Monaghan and Donegal you know, against that. But a majority vote uh, carried the day on that, and so they, um, Carson agreed to support the proposal. With Redmond, uh, Redmond relied a lot on Joe Devlin, uh, who really managed the northern, the Ulster, wing of the Irish Parliamentary Party and uh, uh, but there were uh, uh, two, two uh, important meetings held in Ulster, one in Belfast, well in fact both in Belfast but one was just of Belfast nationalists who voted overwhelmingly <coughs> in favour of the deal and then there was a, one representing, dele one containing delegates representing all of Ulster, all of nationalist Ulster and they voted as I said f by 475 to uh, um, 200 and something, but what was notable in that vote of six county nationalists, the, the vote, the, uh, well first of all Redmond threatened uh, to resign if it wasn't carried, but in, uh, in spite of that, uh, the representatives of um, Tyrone and Fermanagh were in a majority, they, the, um, uh, uh, they opposed the deal uh, and their votes, the votes of those delegates were against it by a majority. So the, it was supported by nationalists of four counties, rejected by the Tyrone and Fermanagh nationalists. <coughs> okay, we're gonna, we're, 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 we're gonna call a halt at that point. I just want, uh, once again, to thank our two speakers and please thank you for your And just before we go, I want to uh, call on Martin O'Sullivan, our host for today just to say a few words. Thank, Thank you. you very short. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Edward Hutton of Bath, the former Affairs and Trade, and um, setting, up just, uh, setting up just our seminar. And I'd like to thank the Kian Cora for coming, and for the speakers, and for you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I'd like to say just a few words about the two islands that we share about the island of Ireland and the island of the United Kingdom. A deal in Brexit will be done. It might be done tomorrow, it might be done next year, but it will be done. And when it's all over, we're going to have to live together on the island of Ireland. And we're going to have to live together, we're going to have to have relationships with the United Kingdom. We're bound to the United Kingdom by history, some of it bad, some of it good, but bound by language and, and literature and, and culture. And, and I call for cool heads on all sides to, um, in relation to Brexit to, to speak softly. I often think what John Whiteman would have said if he was around today. He wouldn't have been shouting across the Irish Sea. And um, that's all I have to say. And I want to thank everyone who passed the phone group for coming here. I hope the day was too long. Thanks very much.